Taking a our Bible. Bible. I'd like for someone uh, who already has it on the tip of their tongue to name me the eight writers or authors of the books of the, Bi of the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament. Eight writers supposing or assuming that Paul wrote Hebrews. You name the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then two P's and two J's. It's the best way to remember it. Because, see, that's going to be on test. <laughs> I don't mind telling you what's going to be on test. I want you to learn these things, uh, not, uh, not, not just uh, try to fool you and so on. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude. All right. <clears throat> We, we had covered Christ's death and the mock trials before his death and those things uh, that surrounded that. We had talked about uh, the fact that he made appearances for a period of 40 days. Surprising how many times 40 appears in the Bible. 40 days and how many days between the Passover and Pentecost, the day of Pentecost? 50. So that, see, that penta means 550. Uh, uh, multiple say, uh, uh, it's 50. 50 days from the day of Pentecost, I mean, from the uh, day of Passover to the uh, Pentecost. But Christ made appearances over 40 of those days, and you said 10, somebody did. There was 10 days between his ascension and the day of Pentecost. So we come to that uh, chapter in the Bible. Some people could call it the heart of the Bible because it finally tells us of that event which is of worldwide significance. That uh, is the start or the setup of the kingdom or the church. That thing that had been uh, prophesied about in the Old Testament. That thing that uh, had been promised in certain ways even to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The last part of that 12, 1 through 3 said what? Shall all the nations of the earth, all families of the earth be blessed. This is the fulfillment of that. How are they going to be blessed? Because the uh, religion described in the Bible is going worldwide. Now, now watch this. This is a family religion. This is a nation of people. So that's a national religion, a family religion. And now this is international or worldwide a worldwide religion why Christ gave orders during his appearance during these 40 days gave orders to his apostles and he said what go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations this is uh, Matthew's account, more or less. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them further. Uh, the reason I said that, we make disciples, the American standard, there's some people uh, emphasize the King James Version, which says teaching nations and so on, and then later on teaching again, and then you'll sometimes hear a preacher get up and say, now it says teach before and teach after. Well, that's a good principle, but that's not the best uh, definition or, or the best way to look at that, according to most Bible scholars nowadays. The American Standard has the better uh, rendering of it. Make disciples of all nations and, of course, teach them to do that, which is right. Uh, but he gave them authority to go into all the world. We call that the Great Commission. What was a limited commission? Anybody? Yes. 
sent them out only to the households of the Jews. That was limited, only to the Jews while he was still on this earth. But now he does not restrict their whereabouts. He sends them into all the world. So that's the reason why, in one sense of the word, this could be the very heart of the Bible. Uh, and uh, that's just a play on terms. So it's, it's not of significance uh, by putting it that way, but you could look at it that way because we've come to that event that will bless all mankind. And this uh, son of God had come and made arrangements for this system to be set up. This system was set up, and we have the terms of entrance into this system or into this organization. If you go downtown and get into the Lions Club, they say, well, it's going to cost you $25 a year. And uh, you have to be uh, uh, living in this county, and they'll, they'll lay out all the rules and regulations, maybe 15, 20 of them, and then you can be a, a, a line, if you please. Uh, but here, what's the terms of entry into this organization? All right. All right. You've got to believe repent, confess, and be baptized. If you want to put one more on here, what would it be? Here. All right. Romans 10, 17 says that faith, which is belief, comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you've got to hear, you've got to know something about the Word of God. And the Word of God says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus came upon this earth. He was the Son of God. And we must believe that and believe that he made for us a way to gain, to gain heaven in the hereafter. We must believe the gospel, too. What's the strict definition of the word gospel as found in 1 Corinthians 15, the first few verses? The what? All right, that's that's a dictionary. Uh, and Brad, you, glad you brought that up, but uh, that's not exactly what I was looking for here. What then? What is the good news? The good news is the gospel. All right, death, burial, and resurrection. Somebody says, "What good news about that? Man got killed." Well, that's why Christ came upon this earth to die for the sins of all mankind, and he was buried, and he was resurrected. He conquered death. Now, we obey a form of this, according to the Romans, the sixth chapter, all through it, but the first few verses in particular. We are baptized into the death, or we're baptized into Jesus Christ, for like as he was, he died, and he was buried in the grave for three days, and he came forth. We repent. We already have heard and believe we repent of our past sins, and we are buried with Christ in baptism. We are put under the water, and we are brought forth to live in newness of life. There's the likeness. And there's the, the strict meaning of the word gospel is good news and uh, the facts of the gospel that, as stated in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the first few verses, are those, death, burial, and resurrection. And the overall sense, of course, is people speak of the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, that's the whole story of Christ and, and his new system. All right. Christ had then now got to the point where his apostles are setting up this new system. And uh, we mentioned last week about the fact that uh, the Bible uh, books are arranged in certain orders. I told you that I saw one Bible where uh, Matthew was not even the first book of the New Testament. Somebody had arranged it some other way, the way they wanted, maybe chronological. <coughs> but those books are arranged for purpose. If we've got to hear and know something, 
we need to know something about Jesus Christ and his life upon this earth and the fact that he is the son of God. So that's a basis for our faith. Hear and believe. And once we've got that, then, uh, then we're ready to uh, do that which is first in knowing or, or in coming into this new situation or this new relationship with God. Must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We cannot be a Christian without believing that Christ is the Son of God. Uh, let's go back to an event that happened uh, to Christ and his apostles. When uh, Christ said, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, yeah. All right. when he, he made that confession, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he confessed his belief, he confessed his faith that Christ is the Son of God. If you are not a Christian and you go forward tonight and say, I want to become a Christian, and the preacher would say, well, do you believe that Christ is the Son of God? He'll ask you the same thing that Peter, right here, uh, confessed. And he'll ask you the same thing that was asked of the Ethiopian eunuch in the 8th chapter of Acts, going back down to Ethiopia. And Philip was teaching him. The Bible says he taught him Jesus. And it doesn't say what facts and all the details about what he taught him. It says just taught him Jesus. We know he taught him all this other because when he came to water, he said, here's water. What hinders me to uh, be baptized? And he said, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And so he said, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then both of them went down into the water, and he baptized him, and he came forth, and this man went on his way rejoicing. So uh, that's an exact example there of a person in the Bible that was uh, uh, saved after the church was established. Now, there are several examples of uh, people being saved in the uh, book of Acts. We could call it, and some do call it, the book of conversions. Actually, the full name of that book is Acts of, of the Apostles, all right, or a history of the establishment and the early church and the spread of the early church, if you want to put it that way. That's what it's all about. And that's what we have been looking forward to all these hundreds of years to the time that would come when all mankind could take advantage of the blessings of God. Now, on that day of Pentecost, uh, Christ had told them to wait and power would come to them. And uh, on this day, they were gathered together and uh, things happened that were not normal. What were they to start with? And all right, that body rushing wind and so on. There's some strange things happening there. And uh, they were speaking in languages that they hadn't studied. I guess it would be the best way for us to understand it because we say speak in tongues. A lot of people sp say speak in unknown tongues. And Somebody else that's a holy roller over here will jump up and say, yeah, I, I told you all along that there's such a thing as unknown tongues. Well, that didn't, the, the biblical tongues were not unknown in this instance. They were those uh, people speaking in languages that they didn't know or they hadn't studied. They had miraculous powers. Now, look at another angle at this establishment of the church. When God made uh, trees, in the very beginning in plants he made a tree let's say just bringing it down to one uh, plant he made a tree and he made that tree miraculously he spoke it into existence in the beginning of the word the word was with God the word Christ was the word he spoke it Christ created he spoke it into existence and after that, he did not speak all the other trees in, into existence. He did not perform a miracle when that oak tree out there was, uh, came into existence here. He set up a natural order of uh, nature that we, we call it. The tree produced seeds. The seeds dropped to the ground. They went down into the ground and came forth. Well, if you want to look at it this way, even. 
went down into the ground and came forth a new tree and that thing there will make 750 each year uh, if you plant all the little acres that come off more than that probably but uh, he made man first by miracle he took the dust of the earth and we understand that to be uh, that there are elements in this earth and mankind and all other things on this earth are made of the elements of this earth he took dust of the earth and made mankind and he of course took the rib of man and made him a mate but after that he didn't make me miraculously did he somebody will say oh that's such a birth is such a miraculous thing isn't it wonderful it just amazes me it's not a miracle in terms of the Bible it's just not it's like that tree is not it's a it's following nature because after that, the seed of man combines with the seed of woman, or the sperm of man, if you want to be quite technical. And you bring forth by nature more human beings. Now, when this uh, church is first established, did you see the miraculous things that happened there? After that, then there is set up a method by which people can come into this system or become Christians. And uh, every time that somebody becomes a Christian, for instance, they're baptized in here, you don't see any special things that, uh, that look miraculous and so on. You're following the order that God set up to become a Christian. Just a way to look at those things. To hear means you've got to learn. Christianity is a taught religion. Somebody will say, well, Nothing wrong with baptizing a baby. That baby, that gets them started out right. There is something wrong with baptizing a baby. That baby can't hear and learn. He's not old enough. She or he's not old enough. They must be able to hear or study and believe. That baby can't believe. Baby can't do nothing much except suck his thumb and run for his mama. Uh, and they're beautiful at that. But uh, nevertheless, they can't do these things. They can't repent. What are they going to repent of? They don't know. And uh, other than kick and squall, they hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, certainly they hadn't done anything wrong in their eyes. Uh, their mama might get aggravated. Huh? And they can't confess, they can't talk. So you leave out all these and say, well, I'm going to take that baby over here and, and let somebody baptize him. Anyway, you take him over to some place and they sprinkle water on his head. Of course, that's not baptism. That's what man calls baptism. So uh, what I'm saying here. Uh, it's good talking points when people might come to you and say, well, what's wrong with baptizing a baby? There's a lot wrong with it. Can't hear, can't believe, can't repent, can't confess. And, and ask them, are you going to bury him in water? So the, a lot of them, the whole thing's wrong. They don't even do anything but uh, sprinkle them. But belief is faith. You must have faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Christ is one of the, the three Godhead, uh, the three persons in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Repentance means a change to turn around. All men, when they become uh, the age of accountability and went into, of course, all mankind, if you want to put it that way, the human race, do those things which are not in accordance with God's will. So if you want to change and follow God's command, you turn your actions around. As uh, Brother Dehoff said that when he was a young man uh, he said he illustrated it this way he was preaching in a congregation up there around Murfreesboro Tennessee and uh, he said I want to show you something about uh, repentance and he got down off the pulpit and he ran all the way back and he ran he said he's pretty agile to the back of the building and everybody's turning around looking and he turned around and as he's turned around he said now I'm turning around I'm going back the other way and when he got back up on the pulpit, he said, I have turned around. I come back. That's what repentance is. Whatever you're doing, you turn. You do something else. You do that which is right. And then if we're not willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then he won't confess us to the Heavenly Father. We must be willing to do this before men. It cost people in the times of Christ, sometimes it cost them their lives. 
oftentimes the uh, uh, the test given to Christians in Rome and there's uh, brought to mind the fact that uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned and blamed it on Christians if they could just get these pe people to say yeah I believe that that man Jesus was the son of God that's all he needed we'll feed you to the lions or we'll take you out and skin you certain things like that or we'll hang you upside down many people lost their lives in the early times because they confessed that Jesus Christ was the son of God that meant they were one of them so uh, we're not uh, ridiculed or uh, we're not persecuted nowadays like that. But there have been times in history when such things did happen. And of course, baptism is a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We come forward. That puts us into this new system and we are ready then to uh, live the Christian life. It's not the end of doing right. We've got to continue to do right the rest of our life. All right. That's in the second chapter of Acts. Uh, the other examples in, uh, in Acts, if you were to just turn the pages through there, you'd find uh, where people were added to the church and the church grew, such statements as that for the first three or four chapters. And uh, then you learn of some of the early problems of people lying about uh, uh, their actions, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. A lot of people were given what they had to help support all those folks in Jerusalem there. Uh, they were away from home and they needed help. And Barnabas, who was a traveling companion of Paul's, whose nephew was Mark, John Mark, uh, had sold a piece of land and he gave all the money to, uh, to help with the situation there, the early church. So Ananias and Sapphira came along and uh, they gave money, but there's no doubt about it. They left the impression that they gave all that they had received. And, of course, the, the wording there shows that uh, while they had it, it was theirs. They didn't have to, uh, to give all, but they did, uh, or they were required, evidently to tell the truth. And they were asked, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you lie to God? By the way, there is an example right there of the uh, Holy Spirit being called God. There's God, uh, uh, Father, God, Son, God, the Holy Spirit. But uh, the the husband was first uh, killed, or he died, and the men seemed to carry him off pretty quick. You remember when Rabin was killed a week or two, two or three weeks ago? They said we got to get him in the beer, in the ground before 24 hours. That's a, uh, the belief of the Jews that they need to get there, uh, those who die into the ground within 24 hours. I guess there's extenuating circumstances, but uh, that's their, uh, their way of doing things still. But these folks got rid of uh, Ananias pretty quick. And uh, his wife came in, and she told the same story, and she died too. So uh, they got rid of her. Now... Uh, those are the those are the events uh, that were happening after the uh, establishment of the church. Now, Christ had said while he was on this earth that he would uh, destroy this temple, and within three days he would arise again. And words to that effect. Well, there were some double meanings to some of those things. Uh, that temple was to be destroyed in 70 A.D. when Titus, the Roman general, surrounded the city of Jerusalem and laid siege to them until they just starved them out. And you know what happened to the Christians before they were all starved out of that city? They left. They had dispersed the Christians. God had his hand in those things. Uh, we don't see uh, miracles like other cases, but God had his hands in those things providentially. The Christians had dispersed. And the Jews, and, and of course there was always hatred between the Jews and the, uh, and the Romans. The Romans were their uh, suppressors. They were their conquerors. And uh, now, during this destruction, the Jews were hated so bad that the Romans destroyed this uh, symbol of theirs, 
their temple. That meant so much to them. It's kind of like uh, the ruler of Babylonia had uh, destroyed the temple. What was his name? Back in the Old Testament times? Nebuchadnezzar. And he took all the silver utensils and gold utensils and all that with him later on to, to serve as a prop for his son to get into trouble with his knees knocking and he died that night. The hands writing on the wall. But uh, here, they hated the Jews so bad that in 70 AD, after they had conquered them and uh, killed great numbers of them, they tore that temple down. And that, I told you before that the, the wall that was uh, on the edge of the mountain, Mount Moriah, was 600 feet high. And some of the stones in that wall were 25 feet long, 10 feet deep and 10 feet high. Now you're talking about a feat of engineering. For those days, that was a genuine feat of engineering. Of course, it might not be greater than the building of the pyramids, but, and that was hundreds of years before that. But they hated the Jews so bad that they destroyed the temple to that extent. And uh, the... Uh, the prophecy, of course, then was fulfilled that not a stone would be on stone, of course. Uh, during that destruction of Jerusalem, if you haven't read any of Josephus' account, Josephus was a Jewish historian which, who was not a Christian. We've got uh, the complete works of Josephus in the library, and then we've got a book or two that's uh, uh, got some information in there that you don't have to read such a big lot to get some information from him. But he tells about the destruction of Jerusalem. Of course, he tells about Christ in there in a place or two. <clears throat> but the problems became so bad that I read uh, one place in Josephus about two women who were so hungry that uh, they made a pact. We're starving. We'll eat your baby this time. And when we get to the point where we're so hungry, the next time we'll eat mine. Uh, so that's, that's the type of stuff that was going on. Uh, and, of course, you can imagine big fights, and when you come to eating my child, I'll hide him, things like that, you know. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to be too flippant about it, but that's, a, that's a, the depth to which those people went there while they were being besieged by Titus, the Roman general. <clears throat> and in Christ's time, he had one time looked out over Jerusalem, and he had said something like, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you... Uh, what you persecuted the prophets and so on. I, I would have taken you like a, a hen takes her chicken under her, chickens under her wings, but you would not. In other words, you wouldn't listen to me. You wouldn't accept me as a son of God. But look what's going to happen to you. 70 A.D. It looked like God's way finally won out. You don't spit in the face of God forever without running into problems. And that looks like exactly what happened to them. After that, the Jews were spread throughout the world. They were persecuted and have been persecuted by many peoples around the earth ever since. <clears throat> but now back to Acts. It's right along in here, right after the cross of Christ. Uh, a man by the name of Saul... Saul of Tarsus came on the scene. He was uh, probably a member of the Sanhedrin or the ruling council of the Jews. Saul was born right here. See, Saul of Tarsus. There's Tarsus in Cilicia. This is part of what's now Turkey, Asia Minor in those days. That particular province had a different status in the Roman Empire than did this. Everything, they didn't give the Romans any problems much, and they had more privileges probably, because Paul used that later on. He was a Roman citizen. And uh, these folks down here w would have been ready, uh, willing to get him killed or kill him on the spot, but he had certain rights. He demanded later on his right to go back over here to the head man. He wanted to go back to Rome, the center of power that had conquered all this area. All right, this man, Saul, came on the scene in the ninth chapter of Acts. Uh, he was traveling from Jerusalem to where? Damascus, right here. 
and he was on a, a mission, evidently by the ruling council of the Jews, the San, Sanhedrin, to go and catch these people who are of the way, or they're followers of Christ, bind them and bring them back as prisoners. Many of them were killed. He was, this man Saul, was present at the killing of the first Christian martyr. Who was that? Stephen. This man Saul was holding the cloaks for him. Evidently, he, he must have been uh, pretty highly respected because he wasn't, he wasn't among the ones, evidently, that was throwing the rocks. That's the way they stoned him to death. And by the way, that's when Christ was seen standing on the right hand of God. In the other cases, it shows him sitting on the right hand of God when Stephen was killed, the first Christian martyr. But Saul was confronted by Jesus Christ. And a bright light shone there around about, and he said, Who are you? And he says, uh, told him who he was. He was uh, Christ. Why persecutest thou me? And uh, at the end of the overview,